Tashi Dele. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sem Tuku, and I am a Buddhist monk from Ganden Shatse Monastery. But uh, Ganden Shatse has split, so we are from previously from Ganden Shatse Monastery. Now, today I wanted to talk about some things um, because the Tibetan leadership are always mentioning about Doji Shukden. And a lot of things they mention changes over time. Because I think when people examine it carefully and they look at it carefully and they look at it with logic and they debate it out, they kind of find that the reasoning behind um, the prejudice and the negative stigma and talk against Doji Shugden is not logical. If you've seen any of my other tapes, I've already mentioned that I am 52 and I received this practice over 30 years ago from my root teacher. And that was back in the 80s. My root teacher was His Holiness Kebjasar Ramji, who of course have passed away. And he gave me this practice because I requested a practice to remove obstacles for my life. And he personally gave me this practice and he personally granted it to me. In Tibetan Buddhism, what your Lama gives you, what your Lama grants you, what your Lama assigns you, what your Guru or your teacher or your Lama, same thing, assigns you, is what you keep for the rest of your life. No other Lama can override the instructions of your root teacher. So if your root teacher tells you to pray to Green Tara for the rest of your life, and keep that as your main practice, and keep that as your main meditation, and keep that as your main yidam, and keep that as your main tutelary deity. Then, by instruction of your root lama, you can meet a hundred other lamas who recommend you to do instead, perhaps, Zambala. So if you meet another lama that tells you to do Zambala, another one tells you to do Zambala, another one tells you to do Zambala, you can do Zambala and incorporate it into your practice, but your main practice or your root practice or your focus should still be Green Tara. If another teacher tells you, well, Zambala will be more effective for you and you should do Zambala instead of Green Tara or you should stop Green Tara altogether or you should spend more time on Zambala instead of Green Tara, then you can politely tell the other teacher or the other masters, thank you for your advice, it's very kind of you, but I will continue my Green Tara practice. The reason is because the reason is because it was assigned to you by your teacher, the person you chose, the person you have agreed with, the person you have in your heart said, this is my root teacher for life. We can have 20 teachers, 15 teachers, 30 teachers, 15, 16 teachers. We can have many teachers, but the root teacher is the one that touches us, the, touches us the most, the one that influences us, us the most, the one that inspires us the most. So that is the one that we listen to primarily. If we have other teachers, we can add on to what our root teacher says to do. For example, if our root teacher tells us to do 100,000 prostrations and another teacher tells us what well, we should do water offerings, we can do our prostrations and we can do our water offerings. But at no time do we substitute our root teacher's instructions. At no time do we eliminate or delete our root teacher's instructions for another teacher. Even if another teacher is very famous, even if another teacher is very great and very well-known and very renowned and very erudite, it doesn't matter because we shouldn't, we shouldn't switch teachers on the basis of fame or name or how many people they have. We should stick to our root teacher because we have checked out our root teacher. We have agreed for this person to be our root teacher. We have agreed to follow our root teacher. So in the Tibetan tantric tradition, it's very, very important that we, once we have committed to our teacher, we follow our root teacher and his instructions or her instructions all the way till the end of our lives. And no other teacher can override that. So I myself have 16 teachers and 
I have received teachings on various sutras and tantras and, and um, transmissions and many, many commentaries from these 16 teachers. And, but my primary and root teacher that I chose was His Holiness Kapja Saramji. So what I practice, what I meditate on, what I do daily in my recitations and in my meditations and in my contemplations is what Saramji gave me primarily. I have some practices and meditations given to me by some other teachers, but I do mainly what Saramji gave me. And if I was to ever change what Saramji gave me, or to delete, or to amend, or to adjust, I would need Saramji's permission. Well, some people might ask, well, what happens if Captain Saramji has passed away and he's not around, or you're not able to get a hold of him? Well, then, whatever we promised him last, we have to keep that promise. That means if we promise him to do certain practices, since we cannot get his permission to stop the practices, we must continue the practices. This is called Samaya or Guru Devotion or Integrity, having integrity toward our Gurus. We shouldn't give up our practices because we're lazy. We shouldn't give up our practices because we find excuses not to do it. We shouldn't give it up because we don't see any results because the results come over time. Everyone's different. We shouldn't give up the practices because another guru told us to. We shouldn't give up our practices because someone famous told us to. We shouldn't give up the practices if someone tells us our practices are not effective or not good. Because why? We have already taken refuge and faith with our teachers, our root teacher. Whatever our root teacher has given us, that is what we must stick to. And if we are not to stick to it, we have, we have to seek the permission of our root teacher to be excused from it. If our root teacher is passed away or not around or not contactable, then we have to keep doing our practice. If we delete or adjust the practice of our root teacher and override it with someone other teacher's advice, then what happens? It says in the 50 verses of Guru Devotion by Ashwagosha, then one will not gain results from one's meditations. For example, Milarepa had studied with the great Marpa. And Marpa didn't give him much Dharma in the beginning. Milarepa has, has done many actions that were very negative, that would become an obstacle to his meditational practice. So, Mil so Milarepa, being someone with a lot of negative karma, Marpa, in his compassion, decided to purify the karma of Milarepa before giving him teachings and even higher teachings. So for years, Milarepa was cooking for Marpa and the wife Damema and the child. He was doing farming for his guru. He was cutting wood. He was, um, uh, he was um, uh, planting, harvesting, cultivating. He did a lot, a lot of work with his guru. And every time his guru, Marpa, would give teachings, Milarepa would try to go into the teachings, but he would be escorted out. Sometimes Marpa would ratfully tell him to get out, don't come for the teachings. So after a few years of working so hard for the guru, serving the guru, and being around the guru, all Milarepa ever received was scoldings, and he wasn't allowed to go to any of the teachings. Milarepa became very disheartened, and his guru's wife, Damema, felt a lot of pity and compassion for Milarepa. So what she did was she wrote a letter and she, in Marpa's name, and she took a gift, I think it was like a turquoise, a big piece of turquoise in Marpa's name and gave that to Milarepa and sent him to one of Marpa's leading students to receive teachings. So Milarepa, with the letter and with the gift was sent off and he left Marpa's house to receive teachings from one of Marpa's main students. When he arrived at Marpa's main student's house, when this person read the letter and saw the gift, he immediately obeyed because Marpa, he thought Marpa had ordered him to teach and give teachings to Milarepa. Instead, Milarepa never said Marpa gave permission for him to teach his student. Marpa never said that 
anyone can teach Melarepa. He never gave permission to his students to teach Melarepa. And Melarepa kept quiet. He didn't say anything. So what happened was Marpa's student gave very powerful teachings to Melarepa and gave him esoteric teachings and initiated him to Tantra and put him inside a cave very nearby to meditate. And the practice that this person gave Melarepa was very potent. And most people who do the meditations would receive signs within a few months. So he would, he would give teachings and instructions to Milarepa. Milarepa would go and meditate. Then a few days later, a week or two later, he'd call Milarepa back and ask, did you have any signs? Did you have any dreams? Did you experience this? And Milarepa would say no. And then the same thing would happen again. He'd call him back and he'd ask, did you receive any dreams or any signs or any, any sort of auspicious omens? And Milarepa again would say, no. So it confused the teacher and he was like, that's impossible. That is impossible that I give you these teachings and there are no signs. So he decided to question Milarepa stronger. And how he questioned Milarepa was, he said, did Marpa actually send you here? Did Marpa actually ask you to come here to receive teachings? And that's when Milarepa confessed and said, no, he did not. His wife sent me. So the student was, the student of Marpa was very, very upset and very, very ashamed. He immediately packed up Milarepa's things, took Milarepa back to Marpa's house and prostrated to Marpa and said, I'm so sorry. Great Marpa, I have been teaching your student without your permission. And then he realized that by teaching Marpa's student without the permission of the Guru, Milarepa was not receiving any signs. And that story represents that when we don't have our Guru's permission, when we don't have our teacher's permission, then it's very hard to get signs in tantric practice. Similarly, if our teacher gives us a practice, if our teacher gives us a practice, if we practice it and we believe and we trust, we will get very powerful cities.